Our guest today is Jordan Goldstein, uh, co-managing co director of Gensler's 270-person Washington, D.C. office. He has had a career that blends design innovation and organizational leadership. And after joining Gensler in 1996, where his innovative, uh, innovative design work has garnered numerous international and regional awards, including several AIA and IIDA awards, three good design awards, and five best of neocon gold and silver awards for product design, his accomplishments in architecture, workplace, and product design have allowed him a unique interdisciplinary approach to design and an ability to influence the direction that each of these practices takes within the firm. Goldstein's work has been published in the Washington Post, the Washington Times, Contract, Interior Design, Architectural Record, Home and Design, and the Washington Business Journal. His views on leadership have been included in several books, including Fast Alliances by Lorraine Siegel. He received his Master in Architecture degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor in Architecture from the University of Maryland, College Park. Please join me in welcoming Jordan Goldstein. Hi, great to be with all of you today. I thought I would uh, do a little whirl through uh, uh, the world that I've been playing in, which is much more than just architecture and, and design. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I believe is that uh, the role of an architect has changed dramatically from even a decade ago, and it's constantly moving. And the question is, where is it going? And where does design education or a knowledge of design education play in today's society? So I thought I would give you a kind of a overview of Gensler, the firm that I, uh, I work at and help lead, and then talk a little bit about my design philosophy and some of the experiences I've had working globally, and then talk a little bit about um, how that shaped uh, my view on opportunities for architects and designers in the world today and for those that are going to be interacting uh, with designers uh, in the world today. So I put this quote up here, and uh, it says, you see things and you say why, but I dream things that never were, and I say why not. And I think there's nowhere more uh, of an opportunity than today uh, in this world to bring change. And it's, it sounds cliche, but there is truly an opportunity now uh, for leadership, leadership where design, understanding, uh, can make a huge impact uh, in the world. So, um, not sure if you guys know Gensler. Raise your hand if you've heard of us. Raise your hand if you're Googling us right now. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, so anyways, Gensler uh, is the largest architectural and design firm uh, in the world. And uh, it is uh, one that is very different. It's kind of a new age design firm, but it's been around for a while. And why is it different? It's because our culture and our understanding uh, of how we approach the world and how we work around the world is very different than a conventional architecture and design firm. Uh, it's, you know, we're designing everything from the bottom left, with, which is the second tallest building in the world, which is the Shanghai Tower, which is under construction now. And when it's finished in about a year, will be the tallest uh, building in Asia and the second tallest building in the world. Um, all the way to a sign, you know, for JetBlue or a wine bottle, uh, you know, as a product design. Uh, that range and the diversity of practice uh, gives us an extraordinary opportunity to pull in people that, are, that represent our kind of uh, staff uh, that have a range of backgrounds and skill sets that's not just architecture and design, but really stretches the boundaries uh, to create kind of rich solutions. So how are we organized? Uh, I thought this would be good because it gives you a little bit of context to, to, to me uh, and to our thinking. But you know, we're organized. We look at studios, design studios, as the building blocks of our, our firm. So we have studios that are you know, 10 to 30 people. The studios are built uh, up such that they create offices. So in my case, I have an office of 275 people, um, and I have uh, seven design studios in my office. And the regions are built around these offices. And we establish hubs for each region. So in my case, the Washington, D.C. office acts as a hub for the southeast region. And there's eight other offices in the region. And then that spreads uh, globally such that we're able to uh, effectively uh, touch our clients uh, just about every 
part of every major continent uh, and country uh, in the world, and we're practicing in a zillion of them now. 44 offices, 20 practice areas, 3,890 people. So let's zoom in on DC a little bit. So Washington, DC, as I mentioned, 275 people, seven design studios, and we're, we're doing over 3,000 projects in our office right now. Um, this is you know, some take, uh, a little bit of a take of projects that I'm involved in. And one of the things for me is, so I graduated in 96 from grad school, fresh out of there, uh, with a heavy understanding of digital design. And it was at a time when design firms really didn't know what technology was. They had invested in it, and Gensler was no different. They had invested in computers, they invested in software, but they didn't know what the heck to do with it. So it was a perfect time to enter the marketplace. So in 96, I joined, and really it was an opportunity to kind of figure out how do we take design software, design technology, and really use it to fuse the design process and kind of create uh, a way to understand the 3D implications of things that we're thinking of before they're ever built. Uh, and it really led to kind of a transformation in our firm. But one of the things I love is that I love diverse practice. I loved when I was in school interacting with different programs, uh, everything from you know, the School of Education to the School of Medicine to understanding what's going on in business. And that kind of diversity uh, is something that I felt really was where the future of design was going, really understanding what does it mean to have an interdisciplinary practice and what does it mean to have people around the table contributing to solutions that may not have a background in architecture and design, may not even want one, but how can they help be problem solvers to create some unique solutions? And this is just a range of some of the work that I've been involved in um, on the screen, but you know, the top left is a restaurant um, in Washington, D.C. The top, oh, sorry, top right, top left is an adaptive reuse of an old uh, Navy building in Washington, D.C. to the bottom, which I'll touch on a little bit later, which is a project I'm doing uh, for Duke University, designing them a campus in China. So for me, though, what I found is over the years, my philosophy has, uh, design philosophy has really kind of enabled uh, an opportunity to not just work in architecture. It's been able to kind of play in places, spaces, and products. So the world of spaces, meaning interior design, and creating environments that people are spending time in uh, away, from the, you know, away from the everyday outside. What does that mean to create a space um, that is truly trying to be experiential? A place, what does it mean to create architectural destinations that are transformative, that uh, cause people to appreciate their environment in a totally different way than they had previously? And products, uh, I stumbled into products in 1999 and I love it. Um, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to affect a smaller world and to kind of get your hands all around an object, and whether it's a chair, whether it's a table, whether it's lights, whether it's a building product, to think about how um, your product could make an impact in the world when it's mass produced thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times uh, globally. But where did it start? Uh, one of the things uh, I, I have loved and has been a, a critical thing for me um, is having a, a chance early on, frankly, in school, to really get an appreciation for global cultures and how architecture has been practiced and delivered over the years in different cultures. So, you know, I was finishing up my undergrad and uh, realized I was two credits or two classes shy of uh, graduating. And I went to the school and I'm like, okay, well, how do I do this? How do I kind of fit all this in? And they're like, well, you have two choices. You can uh, take summer school to finish it up. Um, or you can take, uh, take this program in Italy, uh, and uh, that's two classes, that's two credits, you'll graduate with that. So, you know, I could stay in College Park, or I can go to Italy. So uh, I took Italy, um, go figure. And when I was over there, it was my first chance to really uh, travel, um, you know, uh, internationally at a grand scale, uh, and immerse myself in a culture. And it was an eye-opener for me as a young designer, young architect wannabe, to understand the cultures, understand what, what, uh, what does it mean um, to create uh, architecture that has a level of permanence, certainly in Italian culture. And then I, I went to grad school, and that following summer, so it's like a year later, there was an opportunity to, uh, to go to Japan. And I've been really dying to kind of get, having had this kind of Western cultural immersion, to get an Eastern cultural immersion. So I took that uh, off-ramp and went to Japan and lived in Japan, studied architecture there, worked with a Japanese master, kind of understanding the craft of architecture and design from that perspective. And then I came back 
to finish my master's at Penn, and my, I was totally disoriented. And I was kind of like, how do you kind of get back after that experience? So I started doing a quick internship at an architecture design studio in, uh, in Philadelphia, and I'm sitting there making models. And one day, the, uh, the guy that was running the office comes in, and he's like, hey, we just got a Getty grant to do work at the Zuni Native American Reservation in uh, New Mexico. And we need someone to go down there and kind of uh, work on the Pueblo and uh, interact with the, uh, with the tribe, make some models of, of kind of their historic Pueblo. Um, any, anyone interested? And I was like, eh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that. Um, so I was down in Zuni uh, experiencing this uh, culture, which was kind of like I've gone from Italy to Japan to uh, a, a really foreign experience, but yet it was within the boundaries of the United States. And those three kind of rapid fire global immersions or cultural immersions kind of opened my eyes up to these experiences uh, and a way to look at them and shape design philosophy. So, you know, kind of you know, jumbling in my mind were, you know, how do you mix and blend Western and Eastern ideas? How do you look at architecture of permanence versus things that are more ephemeral? How do you deal with formal versus informal space? You know, what does it mean to be uh, permanent versus, uh, I mean, physical boundaries and psychological boundaries of space? How do you think differently about the organization of space? Global appreciation of materials, just those three cultures alone was kind of a whirlwind through uh, understanding of materials and textures. And then cultural differentiation. How can you design in a sensitive way that shows your understanding the cultures that you're designing for. So with all that in mind, I entered professional practice and uh, right away had opportunities to start working uh, as a designer on projects. And I thought I'd click through a few of these just to kind of give you an idea uh, of some of these experiences. And I think, you know, how many of you have uh, traveled internationally? The majority of you. How many of you are international? Uh, great, okay. So one of the things that uh, I've recognized over the years here is, ever heard of Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat? Yeah, a few nods. Well, like realizing that through global travel has, has made me totally think differently about how we can work collaboratively to deliver solutions. And you know, early in my career, it was an opportunity to kind of play around with some of those ideas, and I wasn't sure exactly what they meant. So one of the early projects was uh, for the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And for those of you guys that don't know them, their, one of their missions, their main mission, is the preservation and conservation of the Amazon rainforest. So they had a space that they wanted to do in DC. Um, and one of the things I was looking at, and this is really early on, was you know, how do you kind of use the materials that you find on a site, that, and some of them could be in the building structure that, they are, that, that it exists, and, and try to build a solution without bringing new things to the site. And this is a while ago, long before sustainability became trendy. And what we recognized was we could actually build an architecture that we're bringing less materials to the site, that it's a sustainable project, that it recognizes and expresses the brand of who they are through the space. So a perfect example of that is this, um, this image. And you know, it's, it's, it's a conference room, it's a workspace, but there's these wood beams. And we actually had a structural engineer come in and I asked them to tell me what beams I could take down from the ceiling without the building falling down such that I could use the, that, those materials to create the architecture in the space. Also early on, there was a magazine called Metropolitan Home and they said, look, we want, we're gonna pick nine architects from around the country and we want each of you to kind of create a prototypical space of a house in, um, in a space, a larger space, such that we can have an exhibit. So they said, we want you to create a living room. And I looked at this as an opportunity to kind of start to, to kind of allow some of the thoughts from my early experiences permeate in and, 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 show, um, and, and show themselves through design. So that idea of the Japanese influences of um, kind of coming in, you know, being able to kind of step up and appreciate space in a different way uh, and then kind of sink down into, uh, into a space. Uh, for the world of product design, um, I'm actually going to go back for this one. So this is uh, in partnership with Sony. So this is a living room, kind of a prototypical living room, but it was without, without using furniture that's coming in. So how do you kind of create solutions using architecture um, and technology to kind of create kind of a, a different kind of space? With product design, it was an opportunity to uh, create uh, products that would be on the market, mass market, but do it in a way that uh, allows uh, the products to have a timelessness to them. 
for those of you familiar with the product design process, you know, it's fairly much a, a blitzkrieg process. You're designing, you know, quickly uh, to get things to market. You're trying to do a market analysis to understand, well, what's the blue ocean opportunity for you to inject new product into a market? You hopefully have heard a little bit about blue ocean versus red ocean or, or red sea. I don't want to be out there uh, introducing product into the world in a competitive marketplace when there's five zillion Me Too products already out there. You know, I want to be out there introducing products that are differentiated. So it was a, kind of a whirlwind for me. It was a few years after I graduated, and it was an opportunity to come in and design products, and whether it was for this company in the Midwest um, or for this company, which had products manufactured in Germany but was actually based in Vancouver, which is dimensional textured glass, uh, it was an opportunity to introduce things into the mass market and start to try to play around with what's known and what's expected uh, in terms of, of product. And that led to an array of, of product um, that's out there on the marketplace now. Um, everything from lighting to glass to um, furniture that you sit on, things that are residential, things that are commercial. So why show all this? Well, through all, through all these years, I've recognized that as we've been designing and me and my team have been involved in architecture, there's been a shift in the landscape. And probably a lot of you are experiencing this now. And that shift is that uh, the whole ideas of, of, of uh, the pressures in the marketplace, everything from the government shutdown we're experiencing now to sequestration that have preceded it, to the kind of larger changing landscape of cultures and the economy globally, uh, there's new pressures that are uh, kind of inflicting themselves on um, architecture and design and op opening an opportunity for those that are interested in design and whether you pursue it as a profession or something that you're interested in, for you to view the world as a little differently. So I've seen kind of my own philosophy shift um, with what's happening out in the marketplace. So let me give you an example. So, okay. Over the last couple of years, uh, when, when the recession hit uh, in, I'd say, late 08, there was a change, dramatic change in the landscape. So what was happening? Well, architectural firms, design firms that were out there were struggling to survive. There wasn't a lot of work, and everyone that was trying to go after that work was lowering their fees to try to get it, and it became like an extremely competitive ocean. At the same time, there was international companies coming in, gobbling up these firms. So there was a lot of mergers and acquisitions, so the landscape was changing. At the same time, it was harder for architects, and it still is, to stand out in a crowd. You know, all of a sudden, people don't necessarily need architects in the conventional sense. What does that mean? Well, it means that out there in the marketplace, there's, you know, out there, I could compete for jobs. There's contractors that have architects on staff that could do it. There's people that actually feel like they can be their own architect and can use tools that are on the web to be able to deliver a design. So it's a savvier marketplace. So how do architects and designers stand out amongst the crowd? At the same time, fees are under pressure. Uh, we, did, we did a check, which was, which was a surprising one, which is we looked at, we pulled out proposals from 15 years ago. And the, the fees that we were proposing then were pretty much the same that we're proposing now. So that means that over the last 15 years, uh, even though there's been inflation and even the, co the cost of, of living and salaries and everything has gone up, the fees for the work hasn't changed that much. So how do you reposition yourselves? And I thought I'd walk you guys through this because it's something that I'm talking about regularly to, uh, to my staff, to Gensler folks around the world, and to the students that I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. So I've started to view there's a shift towards um, Accepting the architect or embracing the architect or designer as an enabler, uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you're actually uh, having an opportunity to move upstream in the design process, um, attaching ourselves to bigger issues, social issues, policy issues, larger design issues, and become a creative partner in problem solving. So whether it's social responsibility, global change, public policy, design can kind of become a nexus to all this. And it actually, the more that it's embraced, can it allow an architect to really, or a designer, or someone who has an appreciation for design, to go far upstream in a process for problem solving. So I wanted to walk you guys through three uh, examples that, uh, that I've seen and implemented in my, uh, my own practice for, for uh, exemplifying what does this mean. So 
The first one is around a multidisciplinary studio. Uh, and it's something that I started years ago at Gensler. And I think some of you have experienced that a little bit through this course, is that uh, you're not a traditional design studio. You bring voices um, from around a variety of industries into the design studio such that you can affect solutions in a very different way. The next one is field classrooms. The idea of getting out in the field and mixing together community members, community leaders, practitioners, students, financiers, developers, together as a team to solve problems. And the third example I wanted to walk you through is around project implementation at a different level, uh, truly at a global level. When you have students, when you have uh, the professionals, when you have clients and policymakers all working together to try to, to make big change through the course of, uh, of a project. So multidisciplinary studio. So uh, about 10 years ago, I created a studio uh, in our office and deliberately went out and hired as some of my first staff members for the studio, uh, advertising people, industrial designers, graphic designers, uh, and sprinkled that in with a few architects and interior designers. Uh, the goal was really kind of getting uh, rich solutions from the variety of opinions, often conflicting opinions, around the table. How many of you have seen the uh, IDEO Nightline shopping cart video? Okay, if you, if you, a lot of you haven't, so that's a good one. Google that one tonight, don't do it now. But it's a really great one about solving a problem. So in that case, um, the IDEO team was asked um, spontaneously um, to design the next generation of shopping carts, right? So, well, they pulled their team around a table and in a charrette kind of fast mode um, developed solutions, but they did it in a really amazing way. Uh, and it's really worth watching. It's about an eight minute video, definitely worth seeing. So in our case, um, we looked at design problems in a very different way. And the amazing thing was, you know, we didn't know if this was gonna work. We didn't know if it was, you know, could you make money at this, could, you know. Um, was this has been enormously successful and it's brought clients into us that we never thought we would have had. And, and what, is that, what is that structure, what is that platform? It means that we threw out the conventional design process. And we said, okay, well, we're gonna look at, 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 at problems through the eyes of understanding the user experience. So that means you know, getting in, observing space, observing the problems, what are the pain points that clients are experiencing, and, and how do you go about uh, observing those, documenting those, and communicating that back such that people understand, the clients understand, well, you have a true opportunity, but it's not to design necessarily a giant solution. It could be just to kind of come in and surgically solve issues. So for us, that's ranged um, over the years from large mixed use projects. Um, we're doing, we're doing uh, advertising for uh, companies now that uh, used to go to advertising agencies. Those are coming to an architecture and design firm. So uh, we're also rethinking brand prototypes. Uh, and one of the things we learned from that was there's a tremendous opportunity to think about brand as it relates to architecture and design. So for me, that was kind of a eureka moment and recognizing that we had this awesome opportunity to come in and start working with companies and their brands. So that the brands that we've worked with include Under Armour, include Hilton, include the company like 3M, and we're working with them to rethink space or rethink product or rethink actually how they communicate to their marketplace uh, and to their clientele and their customers through whatever business that they're doing. The other one I wanted to take you to is 8,000 miles away, and I just did this about a year ago, and it was, it was awesome. And what it was was kind of taking the idea of learning um, and design and just pulling it totally out of the office and out of the classroom and, and really landing at some place where it can make a difference. So I took students from four universities uh, as well as professionals from my firm and a client's group uh, to Bangkok, Thailand, uh, which for those of you who don't know is a long way away, uh, and immersed ourselves in low-income neighborhood, in slums, with a goal of trying to rethink what it meant to create a house prototype or a community center um, that would enable the community to connect in a way that it hadn't before and to help themselves create a sustainable model for growth. So this is a shot from that, and uh, you know, for those of you that haven't seen communities like this, it's a real eye-opener because what you have is these 
uh, residual kind of slum communities that have grown up along these canals and waterways, but at the same time, the city's growing, and the city's growing out and pushing these closer and closer to the water's edge. So their land is less, but their population is growing. So we looked at this as an opportunity to think about the places and spaces that could help uh, create a better community. So out of this, we did two and a half weeks in the field, and then I brought a bunch of the students back to my office in DC to work through the problem. And we developed, at the end, a kind of prototypical community center, prototypical house, and a way to generate money for the community that would enable them to, um, you know, to actually have a sustaining model. So community center and products and home. So the, a really wild thing was realizing these guys had tremendous craft, ability to create things in their community. So we looked at, could you create a model where the community is actually building product, building furniture um, themselves and selling that and then using that revenue to help fund the development of houses and better community centers within their larger, uh, their larger neighborhood. So this is a perfect example. This is um, a, a table uh, cut out of a sheet of uh, plywood, which you can see at the kind of the bottom right, that then can literally be pieced together with ease uh, by uh, the community members. So it could be cut, could be done, and could be basically built, and it was a community product. So taking you now um, to a, a different kind of example, and, and this has been a, a, a wild ride for me, uh, and it's one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences, which is kind of taking that design model that's very, as I said, different than the conventional one of user experience, um, analyzing the problem, the context, um, site issues, and synthesizing those uh, into a, a different kind of solution. Well, what was the problem? The problem was, um, to, uh, and it was a great challenge, which is Duke University wanted to create a new university uh, campus in, in China. Uh, and this was an opportunity to design a whole campus from scratch. And perhaps during the Q&A, we can get a little bit more anecdotally into it, because it's been a wild ride for me to go through this, because you know, if you think about it, look at, think about campuses around this country, right? You know, you don't have a campus growing up from scratch. You have a campus that adds a building because a donor threw some money to the table or threw capital X money. They said, okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and add on to this building. Rarely in the world do you see, you know what? Here's 200 acres of land, build us a campus. And that's exactly what this was. So the opportunity was to go over there, work with policymakers and practitioners uh, and the community, understand what it would mean to land a university there, understand what does it mean to do so in a way that's culturally sensitive, that understands what is the kind of the native architectural vocabulary that is in this part of China, and to weave that in with you know, kind of Western ideas to make a, tr a campus that truly is an East meets West university. So for those of you that know Duke, and this was, this was challenging for me because I was a Maryland grad, and uh, uh, you know, Maryland and Duke are rivals, uh, basketball, although Maryland hasn't won as much as Duke. Uh, you know, I didn't really know much about Duke other than not rooting for them on the basketball court. So I went down and immersed myself in, uh, in their campus, which is on the left, and then at the same time went over to China to understand the site that we were dealing with. And it was this amazing site that is about 37 miles from downtown Shanghai, which when we started the project in 2009 uh, was an hour and a half by car. But now that we're about to finish the project is connected by 12 minutes on a bullet train, um, literally that, that fast. Um, it's in a part of China that is um, very much kind of like a Venice of the East where you have high water table, canals, and low rise buildings that make up a lot of the villages. Um, the other reason you know probably Quin Shan, or may, have, may not know the name, but you probably are using technology from it, is up until now they've had 10,000 factories making the majority of the world's laptops. So uh, they, rec they wanted to change their environment from a factory world into an education uh, center of China. And they looked at Duke as an opportunity to do that. So. Uh, this, we designed a campus that is 200 acres, over 50 buildings, and the first phase is 40 acres and six buildings that's coming online this summer. 
And that instead of building and designing a campus that's kind of done in the traditional way around a green quad and has different halls and different buildings, we looked at kind of this mixed discipline campus that kind of creates and, saw, and, and actually cur carves itself around a water quad, a, a water at the center of a campus. Um, and that all vehicular circulation kind of moves to the surrounding areas and then it becomes a very pedestrian friendly campus. And why is this important is that at the same time that we were designing this, we were getting a ton of pressure from the Chinese government to make this a dense urban campus because that's the nature of the build process there is to build it up. And we said, okay, well, I think we have an opportunity here to create low rise solutions, a very much harmonious campus where outdoor and indoor spaces blend together so there's a series of buildings, um, whether it's, this is the academic building, which is under, this is from about six months ago, uh, under construction now, to uh, an innovation building, which mixes labs and libraries and classrooms, a faculty residence, a 200 bed dormitory, a hotel, and uh, an administration building. And this is actually the administration building. They just kind of pulled the scaffolding off that I'd been working on. Um, for the design to really kind of fuse this with a forward-focused way of looking at uh, architecture in, uh, in China. So I wanted to leave you with one more uh, before, we, before we kind of move to the discussion, which is, um, you know, with architecture and design, when I say moving upstream, what does it mean? It means moving far enough up in the process of decision-making, business decisions, um, looking at uh, an opportunity before it is actually a design problem. And why is that awesome? Why is that awesome for designers or people that are inter interested in design thinking? It, be it makes us kind of a valid member of a process that is looking towards uh, business solutions, smart solutions out in the marketplace that ultimately may lead to design of a building, a series of buildings, a community, but it may not. But it has our voice at the table, which is critically important uh, in today's society. So flash forward to Beijing. Um, this is a competition that we did um, a short while ago. And uh, those of you who probably remember the Beijing Olympics, there's a building that they showed often in the shots that kind of, uh, it's, it's called the CCTV building, Rem Coolhouse did it. This is uh, right next to that. And basically what, what they were doing is they decided to expand the central business di district of Beijing. Um, so they did an international design competition for 15 parcels and they said, okay, um, we want to have kind of next generation thinking. So we entered that and we proposed this twin buildings. Each person had to be, each, sorry, each firm had to be paired with a uh, architectural design, um, sorry, a developer or a client. So in our case, we had a, a client that was acting as um, a voice for one of these parcels. So we designed this building, um, which is a vertical mixed use building, much like the Shanghai Tower. What does that mean? It means that you're actually trying to take advantage of your site and stack uses. So you could have retail, I could have office, I could have residential, I could have hotel, all vertically tied together uh, and then united at, at the base. So this project has, has evolved, but uh, one of the things that's been fantastic about it is it gets to some of the things I was mentioning earlier about recognizing kind of that world is flat, that you can truly uh, be a part of a design process no matter where you are, that you can affect change, that you can be able to deliver uh, solutions, um, regardless of where you sit in the world, but through a global network, uh, be able to truly uh, have an impact. And this, you know, for us, is an amazing opportunity to have an impact because you're expanding um, a capital's um, ability to take its central business district and make it larger, but do it in a way that's kind of sensitive and smart uh, with today's planning. So with that, I'm going to pause, and I think we can have a conversation. Uh, but I put this quote up here because it's something that uh, we kind of reinforce to, to my students uh, time and time again, is everyone comes in to the academic environment and has a variety of goals, but um, the long-term view is that there's a tremendous opportunity for us um, as uh, you know, players in the world to impact change uh, and to be that catalyst for change uh, in the world that we see. Thanks. Gordon, this is the second or third or fourth time I've said this after someone makes a presentation, but this is perhaps the most relevant kind of presentation for this class. Uh, we had, we had um, Kent Larson of the MIT Media Lab um, who runs five different uh, groups in 
the 20, of the 27 at the Media Lab at MIT that are all about changing cities and, and infrastructure and so forth. And I thought, surely that's the most germane uh, presentation we could possibly have, except before that we had Tom Merle of Continuum, and I thought, no, no, okay, that's the most relevant. Anyway, this, all the, all the things you're touching on are, are exactly why we're teaching this course um, about, um, and, and we can talk about a few of them um, thematically, and then I, I would like to get into some of the specifics. Um, but um, one of them that's so interesting, I think, is, and, and, and particularly relevant for, for someone trained in architecture, is the difference between the freestanding one-off project that is incredibly specific to a context, um, uh, you know, whether it's that, whether it's the Fuqua uh, uh, School, uh, Duke uh, campus, or, uh, or any other very site-specific thing, versus the incredibly prototypical thinking mm -hmm. associated with product design and some of the furniture and building products that you've come up with. Maybe we could talk about that for a second. I mean, how do you, it seems to me that those processes are, obviously there are some aspects of the design process that are always similar about uh, coming up with different ways to solve it, but, but at the end of the day, the deliverable is so different in those two cases. How do you manage that? Yeah, it's a great question. I, 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 first of all, I love product design. It, it is, you know, for those of you that have made models or appreciated doing something at a small scale, there's something wonderful about being able to get your hands around mm. the whole thing and really kind of see it. The product design process actually was the most informative for me and actually kind of dramatically af affected my uh, way of looking at the regular architectural <laughs> solutions and projects. You know, uh, the product design process, you know, you go through kind of four buckets. Uh, and the first bucket is the strategy side of things, which is, you know, how are you mapping out uh, the, the product vision? You know, and in order to do that, whether it's designing, you know, a shoe or you're designing a, a, an iPad or you're designing, you know, the next great chair, uh, you got to understand what's going on in the world. So you got to get out there and have this visual observation period. You got to understand, I, I call it in my class, pain points, which is like, what, what's the problem? Why would people want a new shoe? What are their pain points with their current shoe? What's driving them nuts? You know, uh, why, why, why an iPad? You know? So understanding those pain points is part of that kind of market analysis um, and the due diligence of going out there and, and really understanding the problem. And then you design. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I think design kind of gets, um, the term design kind of gets just thrown around a lot. Um, for me, it's more like ideation. Mm -hmm. Because ideation is just, it's that burst of creativity that you're gonna take all that and you're gonna focus that energy around a specific exercise. Mm -hmm. And then a big thing in product is, is the whole two market strategy and the evaluation period. So you kind of go strategy, ideation, then you go to the, the evaluation period and to market. What is evaluation? It means getting, in, getting your product in a room, in a focus group setting with people who may tell you something that they absolutely, that you don't want to hear. That they hate your shoe, they hate your iPad, they hate you, but what, is, what would make them like it? What would make them want the product? And then the whole to market thing, which is something I think a lot of design uh, in the, a lot of people in the design community don't necessarily get, which is that understanding of how do I land you know, this um, in the marketplace with a brand attitude around it and a campaign, whether it's social media, whether it's kind of conventional um, um, media, uh, that makes people want to know more about this thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? So that's, uh, that lens is now how I look at whether it's the building, one building or a campus or, or whatever. Well, I think that's, it's, it's so interesting because I would say um, what Gensler as a firm has done so well over the years, and again, most of you aren't familiar with the landscape of design firms, but Gensler is probably one of the most consistently innovative firms in the world at reimagining what it is that architects and designers do. Um, and as, as a result, expanding the their the possibilities for, for billings are far beyond simply um, conception of delineation of an execution of a building. Rather, it's more like, as we started to chat about on the way over here, it's very analogous to the transformation that IBM made 25 years ago when they went from a, a, a very successful manufacturer of computer hardware to basically a consulting company that helps to solve your problems that may often include some computational component. 
but it was a, it, you know, I had an English teacher um, that had a profound uh, effect on me when I was in high school who talked about how important writing was and how important good communication was. And he said, I want you to make the shape of the letter C for yourself. And he said, okay, I think I can do this. Boy, you're, you know, this is really a great exercise. And he, he, said, he said, now turn it around and show it so I can understand it. And the point was, it felt really awkward and it was hard to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the point is that there's actually, it is not a given that you will be able to make um, help, help other people see the world the way you see it yourself. And right. I think, boy, that's a, that's a central tenet of what we do. And, and I think of what Gensler is doing in terms of broadening uh, their uh, scope of services, trying to get into, make design the primary thing that they do, but, but that is applied to so many, it's a way of thinking. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, for, for, uh, for Gensler, I think that we saw the handwriting on the wall in the, uh, in the 90s, mid-90s, where we recognized that there was going to be an opportunity for a tremendous uh, diversity of, uh, de of design and delivery opportunities in the world mm -hmm. if we could structure ourselves right mm -hmm. to really capitalize on it. So we expanded and got into all these different practice areas, practice areas being like sports design or you know, product design or hospitality. And what was awesome about that is it brought a wealth of knowledge into the, into the firm, mm -hmm. which was amazing. Uh, but it was kind of that shift, like you talked about the mm -hmm. IBM mm -hmm. shift, mm -hmm. um, where you recognize that the core businesses that you were really originally in, yeah, you could still do those, but you need to kind of change it. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, I mean, 68, uh, it's like, I think it was like 68 or percent of our business is repeat business. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a client coming to us and saying, you know, you, know, you did a great job on my building or my space, but you know, I had this idea for a product. Mm -hmm. like, can you help me get this product to market? Or I wanted to do a website. Mm -hmm. So they stick with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, w w you know, a perfect example of a, of a case study for us is AEG. You guys probably know AEG, AEG Live. They threw the concerts. They, you know, they own the Staples Center and the Lakers. So they're a client of ours. And... Um, we did. Uh, we were part of the LA Live complex, um, so we did the, the new JW Marriott Tower, Rich Carlton Tower that's there. We did the Nokia Theater, um, a club Nokia, um, and uh, so they said, you know, we're thinking about going after an NFL team. Right, um, right. Could you guys do a stadium? So uh, and they showed us this parcel of land, which is actually on the convention center site. So our team got in there, and we realized, you know what, you could kind of, in a in a sardine can fashion, kind of. Uh, with, with the right thinking, get a 74,000 seat NFL stadium here. Right. So we're designing that, right. you know, and that's not the reason these guys originally hired us, right. Right. but the diversity of the practice has enabled us to, to, uh, to do that. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy for us to always be referring to firms like IDEO and Continuum, but they are, they are the folks in a way who, who uh, are, are have helped, I think, a lot of people see the world from this, the perspective uh, of the client. And yeah. what is your problem? What is the, I love that you call them pain points, by the way. Everybody has a different, their own lexicon for, you know, what we talk about in this class is, um, you know, I told you one of the eight words is simply the question. But what is the question? Understanding what is the question. One could easily say the problem. Right. What, what right. is the problem exactly? And my, my, my son and I actually often, laugh uproariously at those great late night television commercials, I'm sure you all have seen them, where they try to make a problem out of something that you had no idea there was a problem with. Do you know what I mean? Like opening your, your jar of spaghetti sauce and it shows a grainy black and white video of someone grimacing and they open it up and they spill it all over themselves and you thought, gosh, I don't think that's a problem. That's yeah. never happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they, but they have to convince their audience that this new thing that they have invented, this cheap, expensive, yep. or this poorly made and expensive it's a problem. item, right. must be purchased to solve this problem. Yeah. But I, I, I find nothing clearer than that, those crude, uh, <laughs> those crude right. efforts to, to do what is, of course, essential in the, in the high value world. Um, and I think that more and more firms are in, in our economy, and for these guys, more and more people are going to be um, transforming different kinds of businesses into consulting practices that are multidisciplinary and that look at the world from the perspective of, of the user or the client rather than this is what I, again, the, the, the IBM example is very clear. This is what we do. We make computers. If that's what you need, 
right? You can come to us, but otherwise it doesn't make any sense to come to us. I, I, I think I, this seems to make a lot of sense in a high value economy, an expensive economy like ours. Yeah. We can't be focusing on things that are easily replicated by the many competing economies that, that are in the global world. Yeah, and, and I think uh, one thing that whatever business you guys are going into, whether it's architecture or design or some other thing, I think the greatest thing that, um, you know, that was shared with me early on um, and I think has affected our business, which is you know, take, take the off-ramps. Uh, and how do you keep your eyes open wide enough that your peripheral vision picks up on the opportunities that are there that you can take them and weave them into your practice, whatever that is? Um, you know, anecdote real quick? Sure. Oh, please. So uh, I'll give you guys one example. Um, you know, and I'll, uh, this actually was the kind of the reason the whole Duke thing came up and that um, we went down and we were invited to pitch for a Duke project at their campus, which was a feasibility study of a building attached to their business school. And there was five other firms competing for it. Uh, we, we were interested in that business. It wasn't kind of a core business, but it'd be kind of fun to get into that. Um, so we, and they didn't know us, but they knew the other one. So we went down there and we had a, 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 a wild approach to the, to the problem. And, uh, and actually, to, in order to get the, the project, we actually sent one of our guys who's a user experience guy mm -hmm. um, to the building before the, before the interview. And literally for two days, he mapped out how people were using the building, what their issues were, what they were saying, what he was hearing, um, what he was observing. And he came back and we made this six foot long map. Yeah, experience map. With yeah. experience map, text, pain points, all these things. And we walked into the interview and we said, okay, we don't think you have to sit here and renovate the whole building. Here's your focus areas. And we rolled this thing out. So we won that project, and the, way, and the way we were working with the school, we realized that they were really kind of responding to it. So we developed this kind of connection with the dean of the business school. And um, like the way we work, it was great. We finished the feasibility study, we got all excited, it's gonna go forward, and then the market crashed. And this is 2008. So conventional business senses, you could be, you know what, great, we'll look for the next design opportunity. But uh, I, I kind of, the peripheral vision flags were going up, and I'm like, you know what, I sense that in this economy, these guys are going to do something. Mm -hmm. They're going to pivot. Mm -hmm. And we want to be where they pivot. Right. Um, so uh, you know, the project went dormant. I reached out to the, uh, to the associate dean. I said, you know what? I really enjoyed interacting with the dean. How do I get in touch with this guy? He doesn't seem to respond to you know, normal communication. She's like, yeah, just send him like one line text bursts. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I sent him a line and just said, um, you know, uh, great working with you, what's next? Right. And he sent back, he's like, global vision. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so I'm like, great, how can we help? And he responds back, been to India? And I'm like, no, but happy to go. He's like, okay, two weeks. So <laughs> two weeks later, I was in New Delhi, India, um, looking for, at a site for them to think about expanding globally. Right, right. So that, then that led to, um, you know, a design and then went on a shelf because there was no funding for that. Right, right. So I'm like, oh man, another dead end. Right. So shot him another text and it was like, what, you know, okay, where to next? And he's like, China. <laughs> and, he's, and text back, been there? Um, I'm like, no, but can go. Right. So a month later, went to China right. and realized in the first conversation with the Chinese government that you know, in all the, I didn't speak Chinese, but in all the kind of back and forth, they kept throwing out the number 250 and, it was like they were looking for not one building, they were looking for a full campus. Mm, mm. Uh, 200 acres, we'll give it to you, right. and 50 buildings. So to me, it was kind of like the ability to have that peripheral uh, vision and kind of keep an eye on the off-ramps. The off-ramps can expand opportunity, it can enrich it for the staff mm. and for those that you're working with, but it can take your business in a totally different direction. Right, right. Well, you know, the, the segue to, uh, from a way of thinking, to a place, and we should, I would like to talk about China for just a second, only because, you know, it is, it, it, it's funny, we, we've, we hired just this last year our first native-born Chinese fa faculty member, um, mm -hmm. who's a great uh, architectural historian, and provides a kind of insight that is badly needed, I think, in American educational institutions, because we have lots of people going, uh, lots of Westerners going to China and coming back with their sort of, you know, I went in 2010 and met with um, 
uh, the designers of your Shanghai Tower mm. took all my, they, they were so generous, um, a bunch of, uh, I think maybe, uh, I think you, you guys successfully raided KPF and SOM for some tall, for mega tall building uh, right. people, and, they, and they're great. That is, is going to be the coolest tall building in the, in the world, I think. Yeah, it's going to be um, fantastic. Um, we have one of your, full disclosure, we have one of your competitors, uh, uh, Gary Haney, uh, teaching with us, and he's on our board, and he's doing lots of these very tall buildings over in, in those countries. And that, that's a whole nother conversation, but, but a little bit related in the sense that, you know, Gary gave a, a, a lecture the other night about some tall buildings he's doing in the Middle East. And um, one thing that didn't get quite enough attention maybe was how very different the problem mm -hmm. is that's being solved in um, most of the very tall buildings in Asia and the Middle East, for example, mm -hmm. versus buildings in the United States and Western Europe. Um, the latter, the ones in the United States and Western Europe, are completely pure rational economic engine. They're, when I, when I, they're vertical spreadsheets, uh, right. more or less. Um, whether that's a good thing for architecture or not is another question, but, but you know, that we're not building Chrysler buildings uh, mm -hmm. that are commercial real estate ventures as opposed to not-for-profit museums or things like this. Whereas in Asia, and in the Middle East, the, the engine for building these buildings is completely different. Right. It, 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 they're not talking about efficiency of floor plates. They're not talking about rational economic choices because the buildings have a symbolic purpose for national pride. In this, I was talking with a colleague. They would no more talk about the rational economics, let's say, of a 140-story building in, in, in China or the Middle East than we would talk about the net to gross ratio in the Washington Monument. Right. Uh, just it, it's not this, you're not understanding the problem, right. I guess. And I think right. that's, that's kind of good evidence of, of that. Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a great point. In fact, you know, the, uh, it, the impact didn't really hit me until when we topped out the Shanghai Tower, uh, which is when you kind of finished the, least, the last part of vertical construction, uh, structural construction, and uh, we started getting phone calls from Chinese uh, natives mm -hmm. that were thanking us um, mm -hmm. for what we're doing to help China. Right, right, right. And it's, you know, you're, you're creating a symbol yeah. for us. This is, so, this is so interesting. And you know, in, to the extent that um, w we are in a global classroom here right now, we have people from all over the world in here. Um, and this institution has a very, has a very global uh, sensibility, I think. But that's really, that's really clarifying. I mean, um, you know, in, in Boston or San Francisco, um, private real estate development would never, con in contemporary Boston and San Francisco, would never be viewed with that sign of sense of collective pride. It's more, it's a kind of public versus private right. battle. And does it pencil out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but that, whereas, in, interestingly, in Chicago and in China, this is really interesting, both places are very quick to take collective psychic ownership of um, successful, heroic building projects. I, I, I don't know enough about the sociology of those places to understand why that's so, but it's absolutely true. Yeah, um, interesting. And it is interesting because it yeah. means you would, the problem in those places Very is, is different. Yeah. Um, um, so th that's really interesting. But the, the, I was going to say, the, the, for those of you that have been overseas and practiced uh, culture, you know, with different cultures, I found it uh, amazing to go through an unlearning process. Mm, mm. You know, it's like we, we learn a certain way and then we go immerse ourselves in the business practices and the, the way of work in another place. And it's really, you have to go through an unlearning period mm -hmm. if you're gonna be successful. You have to kind of start to forget what you know right. and be open to learning and practicing in a different way to, to, to be successful. I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that's true. Um, when you think about it, students in architecture school, one of the first things that we ask them to do in a way is to unlearn, everybody grew up no matter where they grew up, they grew up in some kind of architecture. In other words, they, they feel like, I know what a house is, or I know what right. uh, a shopping center, you know what I mean? I've been, to, I went to a school, I, you know, what are you gonna tell me about, about this? But what we wanna do is we want to decontextualize the choices that designers make so that they will be able to be more open-minded and take right. choices that aren't in their memory. I mean, I think that's really, what, what, in a way, what you're getting at, which is to unlearn things means to open yourself up to more possibilities in a, in a truer, fairer way. Yeah, and I think that to, to have the, uh, the ability as a professional to recognize that the way you've done things may not work. Right. 
and be open to totally changing that. In the case of practicing in China, you know, for me personally, it was a business 180. It was everything, it was like, I think there's like a Seinfeld episode about that. It's like, <laughs> you know, the opposite. So like, do right. the opposite of what you think you're gonna do and, and, and actually you'll be okay. Right. Um, and that is a very different way to, to kind of to work. Um, so I now use these plane flights, these long plane flights over there to kind of just you know, have that orientation moment where mm -hmm. you're gonna kind of say, okay, forget, turn, turn off the old, get ready with the new. Mm -hmm. Because when you land, you gotta be on, mm -hmm. and you know, it's game on, and you gotta be able to think you know, totally differently than you were just thinking you know, 15 hours ago. Right, right. Well, I, I think that's really interesting, and an underappreciate, in a way, we all talk about who says they don't want to be globally aware? Who says they don't want to um, you know, be able to engage with uh, different cultures? And of course, it is certainly true that each subsequent generation here is so much more, uh, has, so, uh, has such lower barriers to mm -hmm. connecting with d different kinds of people. I mean, I, I, my, my son is, 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 is 17 and, and uh, you know, the world he's growing up in is so really noticeably different right. in this regard. Sure. Um, but still, we need to be self-conscious about this because I think, I think you're absolutely right. The, we don't maybe pay enough conscious attention to how, how meaningful the, the different ways that people operate in different parts of the world. Yeah, and cultural immersion and global travel while you're a student is, is to me, the, one of the best educational experiences you can get. Right, right. You know, you know whether that's, you know, if you're from someplace else and you're, you know, traveling around, including here, you know, to, to really get that cultural immersion or vice versa. Um, but not just to go see things, but to try to really kind of ingrain yourselves in those cultures. Uh, short, unsolicited advertisement. Um, this coming summer one, I'm going with Professor Shui Shan Yu, who is this new Chinese-born uh, uh, faculty member. We're going to be doing a dialogue on civilization in China. So we didn't rehearse that, <laughs> but I'm, I will pass him a, you know, yeah. a small bribe. Five dollars. Small later. bribe later. <laughs> um, but let's get back for a second to, um, I mean, there's so much, because this is, this whole notion of interdisciplinary, I would say more responsive, more user-centric or client-centric practice is, is, is super interesting. But let's get back to a specific about it because um, now that I've done a fair number of these interviews, obviously themes are coming up, mm -hmm. re resurfacing all the time. And everybody in this room should be aware of the term user experience mm -hmm. and, and experience design and the idea of self-consciously uh, mapping out. In fact, last semester we, we actually did an assignment where they had to make an experience map and I'm slowly regretting that it's not one of our assignments this time because mm -hmm. it, I think it is really a, an excellent um, way to, it's an exercise that forces you to understand how many touch points to use that, their terminology, there are in any experience. That going to Starbucks is not a single thing. It involves right. 17 discrete and identifiable moments. Flying on Virgin Atlantic mm -hmm. uh, is, it has innumerable moments in it. Going to the Apple website, going to the Apple store, yep. going to, well, maybe you want to talk a little, you were telling me about the, the uh, fortuitous um, real estate opportunity in your own headquarters in, in, in DC that turned into a design opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's, you, you hit the nail on the head. I, I, the whole user experience thing is transforming uh, design. Uh, and one of the things we, we'll do a lot with clients, we did it on, our, on ourselves, which is um, a, a day in the life. Mm -hmm. You know, map out a day in the life of your user, mm -hmm. of your client, of who you're, who you're focusing on, and think about how they're going through their day, a work day, a holiday, a weekend, mm -hmm and what are their experiences. Um, in our case, we had this opportunity to expand our office in DC. How many of you have been to DC? All right, just about everybody, great. Um, come visit, there's nothing happening in the government. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the, uh, we, we, um, we're in a commercial office building and we had to expand. So you, the natural inclination is we'll take additional real estate, you know, on another floor. Um, and I watched as two restaurants on the ground level failed and the landlord couldn't lease those. Right. So I was like, oh, that's a great opportunity. So I'm gonna take those restaurants and we're gonna have that giant window to K Street and uh, we're gonna make that part of our space. We're gonna take the whole idea of design, the idea of making something and get it out on the street. So, um, so we took them, we, we actually connected, uh, we blasted holes in our building, kind of connected um, vertically to our other floors and then basically 
had a, a vertically integrated campus within a building that has a frontage to K Street and then used that space as kind of a town hall. So we've been in there since early June, but we've, we've already let our space, which includes studio space and a fabrication lab, you know, and meeting spaces to uh, organizations that need, need to find a home, you know, nonprofits that need a place to meet, uh, schools that want to do a faculty retreat, you know, uh, you know, all those types of things can happen in and around uh, our setting. And then you never know what you find. It's a, I mean, it's yeah. a kind of soft marketing too. I mean, yeah. I mean the goodwill in, in, the, in the area and people see creative people solving problems when they come to a community meeting, who, who knows that that and is I, And I thought them. that we would, people were really worried about like, oh, I'm gonna have people staring at the window, you know, like, like, like the bank buildings where they have, you know, bank offices on the ground level. And uh, the opposite's happened is that, you know, um, I have, there's a famous restaurant next to us and uh, one day I walk downstairs and there's like about 100 of my staff sitting glued to the window. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? And they're like, Bill and Hillary Clinton are eating next door. Uh -huh. We want to be there when they come out. <laughs> so sure enough, they came out and then they ended up coming to our window. It was like, you had all these faces that were kind of like looking at them, <laughs> you know, waving. So the idea of being on the street totally changes the engagement. Right, right. Well, just as an aside, um, which is so interesting, um, the condition that, um, that you described, the failing restaurants in an otherwise thriving, comparatively thriving office market, um, is, is actually an example of the mismatch between um, urban design principles on the one hand, the city planners wanting to have consistent retail yeah. edge right. along every street, who's against that? Except if there's not enough demand to, to make retail establishments viable along those streets, right. you have to have clever retrofitting right. to solve that problem. And I find that, you know, there's a pain point that isn't talked about very much, uh, which is the mismatch between the aspirations or, or people's sense of what a, a viable street life ought to be. Right. I, and, by, and by the way, I, I understand it. We teach it. <laughs> no, and, and actually, it's really a question for you guys because there's a huge debate going on in the retail world right now about what is the future of retail? You know, is it a store? Mm -hmm. Is it a pop-up? Is it uh, an online presence? Is it, a, you know, a, a kiosk? Is it all the above? And no one knows the answer, but it's going to dramatically change oh, totally right. cities uh, and the whole retail experience in years to come. And it's going to be something that, you, you know, I think you guys, when you get in the marketplace, are going to be answering in whatever businesses you're in. Um, does, does a restaurant need to be a, a fixed restaurant that's in a space for 10 years? Right. Or could it be in a really cool bus that moves around and, and uh, just parks wherever it needs to park? And, as they do, and we're used to the food trucks, but that's only one of the options in this new world. Um, Another one is one I saw in China that just blew my skull in. It was so interesting. It was a, a, a bicycle, basically, uh -huh. with an incredible apparatus attached to the back of it. You know, just impossibly complicated, impossibly right. uh, cantilevered. <laughs> but what it was, was it actually had um, a built-in big walk. That was a, a restaurant, uh, right? And, and then the things that stacked on top of it were like, 16 little stools right. and mini tables. And so the guy would just drive his bike, and this was quote unquote illegal, but, you know, but he would drive his bicycle to a wide sidewalk, and from eight o'clock at night until sure. five o'clock in the morning, you could go, and there's a, there's a hostess, there's a, right. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's just taken over this cool part of underutilized street to have his own restaurant. And then he just picks it up and moves and on to the next And just picks it up and leaves. And mm -hmm. I, I thought, wow, this is, that's, it's a, it, it, I mean, all these things are really interesting. That's a kind of analog, low-tech version of right. the digital transformation you're describing. But it is gonna be interesting for us, just note to self that as we're downloading our book, as I get my newspaper delivered on my iPad, as we do all these things digitally, that we are incrementally hollowing out the infrastructure of millennia old urbanization patterns. Right. And um, let's just say we're not really sure what comes next. Do you know what I mean? If like, um, you know, are all of our cities gonna start to have, get, get the disease that Detroit has? In other words, where, the, right. where so much is done virtually, if I don't need a physical analog. Right. And yeah, maybe it is inefficient to sell suits in a series of leased stores that then have to get fed from a warehouse. And what, why, why, why are there all those steps where I'm 
spending money, wouldn't it be better to laser fit myself with some little device that feeds into a computer and have my custom made Shanghai suit delivered in three days? You know, isn't that better? Yeah, and there's, uh, there's some great writings of futurists, and I remember seeing one, I forget who wrote it, but their prediction was that there's going to be a, a 3D printer in every home, and that's how you'll get a lot of products. Right, right. Basically, just say, I want, you know, today I want, I want this, you know, this uh, cup, right, right. you know, or this plate, and then it makes right. it right there. And, you know, if you could go out right now and get a MakerBot printer right. for, right. you know, what is it, 1500 bucks or something right. like right. that, right. that right. you know, it's not that far off. Right, right. But the consequences of these things, you know, yeah. uh, are so great. Dramatic. Um, when Kent Larson was here, we were talking about, and this is, I mean, because of the multidisciplinary nature of what you guys do, I think this is, I'm sure, you know, for example, do you guys have a, almost a think tank component at Gensler? Because it seems to me somebody who is not only solving problems for, that a client is already asking you to solve, but rather is thinking a bit about what is the next, you know, s thankfully we at Gensler have successfully, very successfully transitioned from a narrower business model to a much broader one with seemingly great, great success. But what- Right, what's next? What's next? What yeah, are we I, you know, we, we, we encourage uh, Skunk Works um, throughout. So like I have a little Skunk Works going in DC. There's others around the firm. You guys know the term Skunk Works? Everyone? Yeah, yes? Who knows? Who, who doesn't know Skunk Works? Okay, so Skunk Works, okay, quick, quick, quick lesson. Uh, Skunk Works was uh, invented through Lockheed Martin. So basically at the end of World War II, um, they, they created this um, group at Lockheed Martin that was trying to think of what's the next generation of aircraft. Um, and they recognized that in a large corporate bureaucracy, which was Lockheed Martin, they couldn't do it. So they basically had a group of people that pulled away, went to this smelly bunker building on the other side of the campus which the, where the term skunk works came mm. from, and that acted as a think tank. And they had one guy that acted as the go-between between the politics and the big corporation right. and the skunk works, and there they created the stealth fighter. They created the U-2 plane. They created all this stuff that never would have happened right. if they'd operated in the traditional sense. So we, we, sorry, yeah. we do that, um, and what I, what I kind of tell our folks is like, all right, so where we were was Gensler 1.0. Where we are right now is Gensler 2.0. Help us figure out what's 3.0 is right, going to be. Right. Throw the stone far, create some ripples in that pond, and let the rest of the firm stretch to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, when I try to put myself in the shoes of the students in this class, and I hear, I, I imagine all the time they're hearing about change and things are changing very quickly, and they're going, yeah, okay, well, I'm in college, I've got to get through college. <laughs> um, and, but, but I think the notion of kind of perpetual change and constant realignment and constant need for strategic thinking um, yeah. almost can't be overstated these days. Agreed. And and the idea that designers um, are people who are uniquely, I won't, uh, uniquely is overstating it, are particularly suited towards participating in those conversations yes. is really the reason for the course. Right. Um, that people don't conflate as they always, as often we do, design with, oh, that's that thing that talented people, aesthetically talented people who are gifted in drawing do, and I can appreciate it maybe, but I'm not creative, I couldn't do that. Nonsense. Um, you can learn how to think uh, creatively. You can, and I hope that talking with people who do so on a regular basis with specific examples yeah. is, is a way to get at that. Because, you know, when Tom Merle was here uh, from Continuum, he, he talked about just a number of cool things, but one of them was the development of the Swiffer yeah. uh, floor cleaner, remember? Um, first of all, you know, <laughs> not to be confused with like um, the stealth fighter right. or um, right. a little different. Uh, <laughs> solving global hunger. Right. This was, um, I need to be able to clean my floor in even less than the four minutes that it takes with my squeegee mop. I want to be able to clean it in two right. minutes as the people are coming up the stairs, the hardwood floors, to, as the people are coming up to the stairs to my party. And they were able to really tease out what, okay, what's the problem? What is the pain point? I love, I love your, your term because that, it, it, you know, pain, uh, to call it a point is to, is to already know that you're on an experience map. Once right. you've mapped out exactly. 
this thing, where is the moment of dissatisfaction where there actually is opportunity? Right. So yeah, and you know that 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 stuff is out there every day for creative problem solving. Yes. You know, whether it's the Swiffer or it's the next retail whatever. Right. Um, and, and that's, there was an article, was it, there was a Wall Street Journal article, I think uh, probably about six months ago, about the rise of D-School, the, the death of B-School. Yeah, yeah. The, just the embracing of design education um, out there in, in the world. And one of the things I find phenomenal is that when you go around the world, and you know, I've you know, done uh, several hundred thousand miles, um, in the last you know, year and a half, kind of going around the world and recognizing that um, the, the one common language that people really kind of get around is design right, right. and design thinking. Right. And it's like, when you get people around it, you break down language barriers. I, I tell you, when you go in, I've gone into so many rooms where I don't speak the language right. and I'm the only dude in the room that doesn't speak the language right. and I start to kind of you know, sketch out a strategy, whether that's a roadmap, right, right, you know, right. a, a chart or a design solution, everybody gets around it, right, right, and they're like they all start to contribute into the, in the problem solving. You know, okay, that's that's this is, this is great. You know, it's it's almost inevitable in a course like this that the segues are really good, um, <laughs> but um, this notion of um, designers offering a, a way of visualizing uh, things for other people. This isn't about. Um, I mean, yes, you. Yes, it's helpful still in the digital age if you can draw a little bit and you get better at it as you do it. I mean, in other words, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be Michelangelo. But the idea that you just go ahead and try to help people to understand things in a, in more than one way. Right. Um, and I think about, you know, one of the challenges that we've faced in architectural education, as I'm sure you know, but you've also probably faced it in the profession, is as we have migrated from hand drawing to digital CAD programs, there's an awful lot that's great about that, right? Just as, you know, if you ever had to, I don't know if you guys probably ever did have to write a paper, handwritten paper when you were in grade school, and if you made a mistake, you had to start again, or you had, mm -hmm. you know, it was really a pain, and now that you've been doing it in Microsoft Word or Google Docs forever, editing is, so, so easy. But there is something, I think many people would say, there, if, you, if you really understand, let's say, the experience map of, of communication, um, there, is, there are advantages to hand drawing mm -hmm. in, in their, their immediate biological connection to your idea. In other right. words, there's not an interface. Right. Uh, um, their intuitive, their ability to capture intuition that, that, that there's not a menu item for all the time. Yeah, and, and I'm finding that today, more so than ever before, like the, the tools in the toolbox to help articulate a vision are, are so much more varied mm. uh, and can be pulled at greater, um, at a greater you know, click to basically solve problems. So it's like you know, hand tech or tech tech. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, there's, yeah. there's that opportunity to kind of use it all. And uh, I don't know if you guys, I mean, you guys played in Google SketchUp, anybody? Who uses SketchUp here? Is it just the architecture student? Anybody who's not an architecture student? There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, we, we, we use that sometimes. We use Revit uh, and other BIM-related tools. But if you think about it, it's like, uh, I can go on there, and whether I have design skills or not, I'm thinking about, all right, I, I got to put furniture in my living room, mm -hmm. right? And I can go and I can build my living room box, and I can go in their 3D warehouse, which is like, you know, everyone's connected. And I can pull furniture from anywhere you know, in the world off, off the web. And I can, I can just basically visualize that. And how much quicker you can have a, a meaningful conversation around that yeah, yeah, versus yeah. trying to explain, all right, my living room is 10 by 12. Right. And I got, a, I, got a, I got this door on this side. I got, you know. So um, the, and the drawing is a, as, as common as a really good one. I mean, it, it's drawing a lost art. Is, right. And the idea to be able to use your hand, I think, is. Uh, uh, is, is a real question that's out there. Um, there's a, there's some, uh, one of the things I also love about a uh, program like SketchUp is it's like, you know what? Let's make it look like a sketch. Right, oh, well. You, know, you click X, F7 or whatever, and it's like, it looks like a sketch. You know, yeah. you're done. I, I remember this actually very well at, 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 at the equivalent of um, you know, IBM uh, in the 80s, which was Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill uh, in the architectural world, maybe. Um, 
when because the, they were very early adopters of big mainframe computers running some drawing programs, and they had the ability to turn a very hard line, detailed yeah. uh, thing into something that looked wiggly and well. This, we're just sort of thinking this, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sketch well, interface. Well, yeah. it's a and, and it, it doesn't seem like a desirable outcome if you're, for a draftsman, but for communication, it's essential so that no client would get the impression that we've already made all these decisions before we've actually interacted with Right. Um, I just thought, I, I don't, you probably can't see this from, from where you are, but I, I just made a super fast Venn diagram. The three overlapping circles, you guys see these all the time, right? Well, actually, I find this to be one of the very powerful, I mean, there's great memes on, the, on Facebook and on the web of, of all different kinds of Venn diagrams. Mm -hmm. um, but that, are, that are, can be hilarious. Um, but, but it really is a great tool for communicating to somebody what you're doing as a designer. I'm I have three completely discrete sets of deliverables. Right. And we've been talking about them, but let me help you understand why we're moving in this direction. It's not a vision of the thing. It's a vision of your thinking that's helping to assure the person you're talking to that he or she is being understood. And that's part of the visualization process, it seems to me, very much. You know, it, it, it's great you pointed that out, and I'll give you guys a perfect little uh, context for this one. I was, um, last week, uh, I'm doing a project now where um, it's for the Motion Picture Academy of America, and um, it's, uh, the, the, the clients, my clients are the six, are six of the main movie studios. Mm. And we're trying to do this project, and uh, they were all having a whole thing about how do we get it done, and they, you know, there's all these complexities, and, and it was like, no one could understand. Right. And there was like a whiteboard in the corner of the room. Right. And I just grabbed the, the, the marker, right. got up there, and just said, okay, if we kind of look at it like this, and this is the process, right. and just kind of did a diagram through, and it was like, all of a sudden, everyone's pulling out their camera, and they're taking pictures right. of it. They're like, well, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. the process. So we just cut through two hours of conversation. Oh, this, is, this is so good, because this is, if some of the students have wondered why the last word on our list of eight words is leadership, it is because this is a perfect example of how design creates an opportunity for you to be a leader in that situation. You might have, up until that point, you were a team member of a, of a group of smart people right. from different, with different areas of expertise who needed to get someplace. And so, you know, leader, navigator, uh, choreographer, there's a number probably of words that one could use to describe this aspect of design, but I think it's pretty important. Yeah, and leadership is the prime word. So the, 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 uh, the, the subtext of, is, is whatever you want it to be. You're a leader of what? Business, leader of design. Um, I, I think uh, there's a, it's kind of a cliche term, but leaders lead. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, see, I, I see this so much um, as I cross cultures and, and do work globally, which is that um, the, the person that can really um, articulate the vision, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's drawing it out or verbally or, or a combination thereof, is that you are, um, you can have, you have a leadership role. Right. And when you're in that position, you can really drive change. Right, right, right. And that's, that's the opportunity. Right. Yeah. That's, a, it's, it's great because, you know, again, students often hear, well, it's very important for you to be a good writer. It's very good for you, very important for you to be a good communicator, both of which are very, very true. Um, it's impossible to lead without being a good communicator. I think, I, I don't I, I, think you can do it without would, being a good communicator. I would agree, you gotta be a good communicator. Um, and that means, you know, you can't run away when somebody um, offers you an opportunity to speak in public, terrifying as it may be. You know, they will, since we're gonna use Seinfeld as a, as a reference point, I think I probably shared with this group before the famous observation that the things that scare people the most in life are, are speaking in public and death. Yeah. and that um, death came in number two, and speaking in public was the scariest thing. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That's, <laughs> it's so true. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, you can, and you know, the thing is, you can get good at it when you're in college and never be scared of it again, or you can spend your life in terror that you will be asked to, you know, what if somebody turns to you at an event, a wedding or something, and says, so, do you have, would you like to make a few remarks? Yes, how do I get out of here? You know, that's probably not the way you want to answer. Right, no, no. And, and, I mean, public speaking or whatever, whatever opportunities you get to, to articulate your voice and, and grow your voice yeah. uh, is, you know, amazing experience for 
later in life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so many, we've, we've talked implicitly about so many of these things uh, already. Obviously, the context for what you've been doing at Gensler is a dramatically changing commercial environment and one that is rapidly globalizing. Yeah. So those two, at least those two dimensions are, uh, I think, have, have come, come out of this clearly. Your, 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 um, you know, one of the big takeaways for me of this is going to be pain points. Mm -hmm. it, it just because it's another, it's a, it's a smart and specific and articulate way of getting at, of identifying where the problem is to be solved. Mm -hmm. And so that, that in our sort of questions area. Another word that I didn't mention to you earlier but that you've taught, we, I guess is also implicit in what we've talked about is empathy. Mm. My friend Peter Dixon, who's the uh, chief creative officer for Profit in New York, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, uh, really good uh, branding and identity firm, um, says that's like the most important thing mm -hmm. in his entire creative life is when he learned, he, he was trained as an architect right. around the same time I was, when it was all about language, it was not about client, mm -hmm. We were trying to resurrect. How do you teach empathy, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, we just it wasn't. Well, we it wasn't even on the table. Yeah. yeah uh, because it was uh, architecture was at a moment where we don't we we don't expect you to even know what your problem is. Don't worry, we're going to solve it because it's a it's a rhetorical problem. It's right. how does a building look appropriate in D.C. Uh, and then and, you know, we'll take care of that. We'll take care of that. So you just you just we'll tell you what you need, which is of course. It wasn't until he got over that yeah. and understood that it was really about understanding the deep, you know, almost anthropology of, of your clients or users so that you can find what they actually need. Yeah, and, and empathy is, is a really, uh, it's a good word that you brought up. I mean, for me, it's like it hits in different ways. And uh, I think nowhere more, um, you know, apparent than uh, I did that. I, I, I got passionate around design for the aging mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago, largely because I was at my grandfather's, who's since passed, um, one day, and he and my step grandmother, they were in their, their original, uh, original home, and they, they said, We got to get out of here. Right, right, we right. can't live here anymore. Right. Because we can't function in this house. Right. And I was like, Oh my gosh, well, why? Right. And realizing when you look around, there's all these pain points that are right. causing them to have problems, and it's like, There's got to be a better solution. Right, right. So, what are the other solutions out there? Sticking them in a retirement home seemed to, was like the only uh, option out there. So there's got to be some middle ground. Right, right, right. So there's an opportunity. Yeah. And it's through the lens of empathy right. you realize, okay, uh, there's a way maybe I can help. Well, this is, this is actually great um, because uh, another thing that we're doing at the school is expanding, dramatically expanding our healthcare um, mm -hmm. role in the built environment. We're doing a funded studio this year with CVS develop oh, really? new prototypes for yeah, cool. the next stage of their minute clinic but that's more, <laughs> more about that's more about you know real primary care and retail yeah, in, it's a good in inner cities w that have been dramatically underserved and, mm. but we should talk about it because that's a yeah, uh, that's, that's an opportunity right. for collaboration yep. um, iteration we're, we're, I, want, I want to give the students an opportunity to, to ask us uh, some questions but let me just um, and we've talked about visualization, we've talked about innovation, certainly. Um, we could, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about two more things. One is iteration, and the other, other one, and maybe we should start with this other one. The other one is metrics, because I think it's so important for our students to understand how you feel the work you guys do ought to be measured, how you measure success, sure. and then how your clients do. So, so for, I realize you do a lot of different things, and so right. the answer to that question would be varied, but, but like, since we talked about the difference in the engines for tall buildings previously, um, let's take the, the people at Duke and your China campus. Yep. Uh, what are the metrics for success there, let's say in, co in comparison or contrast, with the metrics for success on an American campus? Mm -hmm. um, it, are they trying to do the same things? Are they measuring them the same way? Well, and that, that's what's, why it's been such a wild journey because when they got into it, they really didn't know. Mm. So we were, you know, me and my team were uh, basically helping to frame up all of this. Helping uh, to define the problem. Define the problem and then solve the problem, which was awesome. I mean, so many times as an architect or designer, you're coming in and you're pretty far along yeah. and, that, and the problem's defined. Well. Right. This was defining everything at the beginning, and I think their measure of success is very different than American mm -hmm. campus. 
that you know the goal is to to, to grow this uh, through I, I think uh, a series of almost incubator strategies. So it's like if I if I put a program over there for global health mm -hmm. or a program over there for uh, business, right. you know, when I try it out, right. you know, let's let's see how that takes. Right. Um, and I think there's that big question too of you know right now it's it, and you know we have it in this room is that um, a lot of cultures uh, believe that um, the, 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 the some of the key brands of universities in the United States that we'll send our kids there mm -hmm. to get that education and pay for that whatever that is. Right. Um, it's a different point of view when that brand all of a sudden comes to the home country. Yeah, I bet it is. I bet it is. Yeah, and, and, what, what, and what, with good reason maybe. Yeah, because because what a student at Duke or Northeastern is getting is, yes, they're getting the courses, of course, though, but that's the most, you know, and I hope they're getting superb instruction and exposure to great researchers, yeah. all, all those kinds of things. But they're also getting um, Boston um, exposure for them to a global experience, right. exposure to a new network of people, much of which cannot be replicated, will not be replicated in, in, in it was a Kush, uh, Quinshan. Yeah. Quinshan. And so, so what does it that's mean like an experience. Yeah. You got to which ones? Are, all the, these things were all green lights right. here in the states. But when we're taking this over there, a bunch of them are now amber or red lights. Yeah. So what does it mean to create a Quinshan experience? Are and there that, things you can add that exactly new things you can add? But so anyway, I think that's that's, that's yep. and super it, interesting. And it's fascinating. And it's going to be one of those things where the answer isn't there yet. And it's you know a lot of times you 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 know you deliver a project and that's solving a problem. Right. Right. But I think in this one, it's going to be, it's, it's iterative. It's going to keep going. Right, right. And right. Um, that's what's exciting about it. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. Okay, do, I, do we have questions uh, from, from our audience today? Okay, it looks like people are not getting enough rest. Make sure you get <laughs> enough rest, okay? Um, all right, well, please join me in thanking uh, Jordan Goldstein.